Welcome. It's so exciting to see so many faces joining us from all over. We are thrilled. Oh, so many faces that we recognize and many of you from the online courses. This is really such a treat for us. Um, thanks so much for joining us for the Sustainable Invention and Green Chemistry Industry Panel. My name is Kate Anderson. I'm Director of K-12 Education here with Beyond Benign, and I am thrilled to be bringing to you this powerhouse team um, of amazing women in the industry who are going to share with us about their experiences at Nike, PepsiCo, and Patagonia. So very exciting to have Renee, Sri, and Laura joining us for this panel and we're gonna we're gonna take it away so as people are joining um, we greatly appreciate you to stay on mute but we want to keep the conversation going um, and please put into chat as you have questions I'm gonna click and turn over oops mm -hmm. here we go um, I'd love to introduce Maddie Morin, who is behind the scenes with us today, helping to manage conversations and uh, keep us going on social media. So Maddie, do you wanna say hello? Sure, yeah, my name is Maddie Morin. I am Beyond Benign's K-12 program coordinator. I'm on for the summer. And so just as Kate mentioned, we do have this opportunity to engage with these incredible panelists. Um, in this Q&A session and hearing from them, but we can also take this conversation online. So if you'd like to tag at Beyond Benign on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, whatever platform you use, we probably have too. Um, and to keep the conversation going in the chat. So we have a designated question and answer time at the end, but if one of the panelists is speaking and you think of a question, feel free to pop it in the chat and we'll make sure to kind of gauge it so we can include it at the end during that time as well. Excellent. All right, thanks. Um, and what we'd love to do is actually populate the chat now with where you guys are from. So on here, we've got, um, you know, we engage with teachers across the country and across the world. Um, so we'd love to know where you are coming from. We know that many of you are participants in the have either just taken the intro to green chemistry or advanced green chemistry online course, or many of you are joining from the Sustainable Science Colorado course. Um, we also have, you know, basically opened up this opportunity to all of the friends and family, if you will, of the Beyond Benign community who have been doing green chemistry education um, advocacy over the years. So if you could put that in the chat, that'd be awesome. Excellent. We've got, we've got Colorado, Jamaica, oh, phenomenal, Washington, Brooklyn, New York, oh, all sorts of great places, um, terrific. So just to give ourselves a little grounding, again, understanding that this particular audience, you guys are really well versed in green chemistry, um, which is fabulous. And I think getting to know and understand, you know, some other really great examples of what's happening in, I love it when the screens don't advance. Oh, there we go. Uh, oops. So before, before I jump into that, um, we did just want to be, you know, have this understanding that we've got folks from all over the all over the world tuning in today. Um, and we're really fortunate to engage with such a broad audience. So we wanna just take a quick moment with a land acknowledgement. Um, and we do this because we understand that, you know, where we are operating from is unceded land. And we wanna make sure that as we acknowledge in today's virtual space that, you know, you and many of us are in unceded land. We want to start really being able to, um, tell the story of how, you know, the communities in which we are in, um, you know, we're sort of actively working on decolonizing our organization practices and programs um, to really be as inclusive as we possibly can. So I wanted to just take a moment there. 
So like I mentioned, many of you, you know, come from this opportunity of already knowing a bit about green chemistry. And so, you know, what is the opportunity that we have when we think about solving sustainability challenges through chemistry, there is this growing demand for green chemistry skills, which is exciting um, and really makes us poised to be able to engage and inspire others to go into the field. Um, so some of these metrics will hopefully get you excited to tell that story um, with your students and with others in your community. And here at Beyond Benign, we really envision a world where the chemical building blocks of products used every day are healthy and safe. And how are we gonna do that? We're gonna transform a community that empowers educators to do this work with us. Um, and many of you are exactly the people who get this message out there and inspire uh, students to pursue and you know, get into the field of green chemistry so that you can be inventing and creating solutions for not only today, but for tomorrow. So our programming, we focus on three main areas, investing in educators, developing tools and resources, and supporting peer networks. And we have three programs that enable us to do that. We work in K-12 education. We work with the Green Chemistry Commitment, which is our higher education program. And we recently just started growing and building what is the Green Chemistry Teaching and Learning Community. And this will be our platform in which all of the educational community um, can come together and work uh, towards advancing the field of green chemistry. Now, when we talk about moving across an education continuum. It's really, you know, crucial and critical when we're starting at that K-12 level and getting students excited and demystifying chemistry so that they see it as a tool and a way that they can create sustainably. Um, you know, additionally, we work in out of school programs. You know, we get those undergrads ready to, to build on those chemistry skills to enable them, um, you know, as they go forward in their professional, um, you know, experiences, that's where they start to be able to have the skills to create inventions and create innovations. And then when we think about industry, this is why it's the entire um, continuum, because that is where we're transforming and inventing new sustainable um, innovations and practices. So with, with you know, keeping that in mind, it's really exciting to have this panel um, today for us to, to chat. So I am going to, without further ado, uh, introduce our, our panelists. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. And I'm going to introduce our first panelist. So Renee, oh, I'm gonna have Renee go ahead and she can, take over sharing, sharing the screen. And while, while we do that transition. There we go. Oh, awesome. Excellent. All right. So Renee Hackenmiller Paradise, she is a senior chemist and director of the Chemistry Center of Excellence at Nike and located in Beaverton, Oregon. In this role, Renee works across Nike with her external brand partners to scale more sustainable chemistry and implement strategies that reduce the impact of chemistries used in manufacturing. Before joining Nike, Renee held roles in government, NGOs, and academia. She has a bachelor's of science in cell and molecular biology from University of Washington and a master's in public health from, uh, sorry, I, master's in public health management and policy from PSU and a PhD in genetics from the University of Chicago. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Renee to share with us about her experience and what it's been like working at Nike. All right, Renee, take it away. Great. Well, uh, thank you to uh, Kate and her team at Beyond Benign for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys um, about what Nike is doing in green chemistry. We, are call it, we call it cleaner chemistry interchangeably with uh, sustainable chemistry, safer chemistry, circular chemistry. All of these things mean the same thing at the end of the day. How can we reduce the hazards of the chemicals that we're using to make our product and um, reduce our overall chemical footprint. So 
Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking to you guys about how we're going beyond compliance to, to promote the adoption of safer alternatives and the main tool that we've been using to reduce our um, chemical hazard footprint. So, um, oh, that's not letting me go. There we go. Okay. So this is, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is kind of like traditional compliance management for chemistry. So in the manufacturing process, at least one that Nike uses. So we We've got programs that have controlled input management through a manufacturer restricted substances program. Um, and Nike is aligned with a bunch of a, a, a large number of other footwear and apparel brands in this organization called ZDHC, which is Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals. And so we have a common manufacturing restricted program that we, we use. And so that's how we control what we're bringing in. And then we have a various programs to manage what's in use. Um, you know, risk mitigation, uh, chemical health and safety, all that kind of stuff. And then on the output side, so what's coming out of the product that's coming out, we have a restricted substances list. Um, we test our wastewater for compliance to these various targets. Um, so this is kind of the traditional like chemistry compliance management. Um, we have a lot of external collaborations around this. I mentioned ZDHC or zero discharge of hazardous chemicals. And then there's another group called a firm, which is a, the restricted substances list group. Um, and all of this is really driven by global chemical legislation and regulation. So um, Nike, we just make um, one product for global production. We don't make different product for different regions, depending on regulations. It's just simpler, honestly, and then doing the right thing. So we're meeting the highest standards um, for global compliance for all of our product. Um, but with that very traditional compliance regulatory focused um, paradigm, we've, uh, we've run into a lot of challenges in the past decade. The first one is this chart. This is just showing the increase in global regulations on chemistry. So keeping up with them, um, you know, we can't, we're kind of like the Titanic. The Titanic. <clears throat> Nike is a very large organization. And it takes us a long time to make changes that, that trickle throughout our entire supply chain. And this increasing pace of regulations on chemistry, especially in consumer products, um, has given us, gave us a lot of pause about 10 years ago. <clears throat> and then in addition um, to the growing regulations, this is a hyper adapt, so our, our um, self-lacing shoe, um, we were bringing in new materials that we didn't traditionally see in our supply chain. So we know very well how to regulate, or we know what chemistries are used to make polyester and cotton and, and materials such as that. But when we started bringing these completely new materials that we had never seen before, our existing compliance framework wasn't set up to deal with these new chemistries that we were bringing in from new materials. So based on that, um, we decided to rethink how we are addressing chemistry. So this is a bathtub. Think of the bathtub as all of the chemistry that we use to make all of our product. And we make a lot of product. Um, we've had a, we have programs that have worked to phase out specific chemistries. So we stopped using PVC. We've got a, um, a PSC or perfluorinated chemistry phase out. So we've, we've got programs where we're stopping the use of particular chemistries. And then we have programs where we're improving the efficiency. But with all these new materials coming in, as we are draining the tub of chemistry on one side, we we're bringing in all these other new ones that we didn't you know, necessarily know about and had no good way of tracking and monitoring it. So then based on that, um, we've implemented a program four years ago called um, it's our Nike Chemistry Assessment Program. So we, this is our process for evaluating chemicals using a consistent framework. The Chemistry Center of Excellence, which I lead, completes assessments on any new chemicals or materials prior to them being used in Nike products. And um, why are we doing them? Those reasons I mentioned before. Completing these assessments helps us uh, have an, an early idea of, of what's coming in. And so then we can either reformulate or figure out other solutions. And um, making sure that the chemicals we're phasing out of our supply chain are uh, not being brought in with, with new chemistries. And it also helps us to meet our uh, 2025 sustainable chemistry targets. So these are the, thing, the major things we screen for at a very high level when we're doing our chemistry assessments. 
So we're looking for market access. So those regulations that would prevent us from selling that product because it uses a particular chemical in it. Um, and then we've also got priority chemicals. So we just came out with a list of, of 10 priority chemicals, which we're phasing out of as part of our 2025 targets. So that's the first screen. We're also screening against high hazard chemicals or which we call hazard category one, or that would be benchmark ones as part of a green screen. And then the third uh, big category we screen against is dermal sensitizers, high dermal sensitizers. Um, and we made that decision because a lot of you know our products are worn, and then also the people in our manufacturing sites are they're touching these products, and 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 um, so we wanted to reduce that potential impact as much as we could. So that's a high level what we screen for. This is a more detailed review of what we do, and I'm not going to go completely through it, but but essentially the Nike chemistry assessment we're requiring a full formulation disclosure uh, from our suppliers of what's being used. We do a, a desktop, this is all desktop on a, you know, uh, on an automated system, but um, we also do a screen for those restricted substances list. Um, we do a dermal sensitizer screen. We look for legislative potential impacts, legislative, um, legislatively hazard assessment, and we generate a score. So this score indicates to us if it's a, an acceptable material or an unacceptable material. There's a lot of details in between that, but that's the general idea behind it. Um, so we've started using this about four years ago. It ensures the compliance to those chemistry compliance standards that we meet early on so that teams aren't spending a lot of time developing a material that they're not going to be able to use because of regulatory concerns. Um, it helps us with our sustainability targets. It's a hazard-based approach, which was a big shift from us because um, we used to be more of a risk-based approach, but this is really looking at the inherent hazards of those materials and the chemistries used to make them. Um, it's a consistent methodology, which is aligned with another a bunch of, uh, a handful of other um, brands, Levi's, H&M, um, and Gap also use a similar methodology. And importantly for me, it moves us from a reactive place where we are responding to all of this regulation coming to a proactive because we know going in that we're, our products that we're creating don't have these hazardous chemicals we're concerned about. And so then we don't need to worry about the regulation. It's not quite as simple as that, but that's, that's the ultimate vision, right? Is that we, don't, that we don't even need to worry about what regulation is coming because we know that our products are hazard free. Um, and in addition, it provides guidance on what we want. So we have these restricted substances lists in the the manufacturing restricted left substance list, which we're saying, don't use these chemistries, but this is a way to say, actually, these are ones we want you to use. These are better, these are more sustainable. And so it, it enabled our suppliers to bring us things that, that we want and they know what we're looking for. So that's helped in that dialogue a lot with a lot of our suppliers. This is just a screenshot of, so of the, uh, tool software tool we use so we use Cyvera lens rapid screen there are other tools that you can also use but I just want to point out some of the the um, key features of this you can see along the top here this CMR D those are all toxicology endpoints and so we're screening against all of those um, this is water so we expect everything to be green green is good red is bad black is really bad um, this is water as an example, so we would expect it to be green. That's good. Um, and we are evaluating for three important classes. We're looking at 16 health endpoints, so carcinogens, mutagens, dermal sensitizers, environmental impacts, persistent, bioaccumulative, and then some physical properties, flammability, reactivity. Um, so we do this for, for all of our materials at the ingredient level, so at the cast number level, um, and we get these kinds of readouts. This is uh, another um, view of what we can look at. This is a different formulation, but you can see all of these different ingredients for a particular formulated product. This isn't a Nike product, this is a, a skincare product, which we pulled off that had full disclosure. Um, but get, we also have this kind of readout at the top. We can see if, if anything flags for the RSL. Um, the HC is hazard category. So red would be a hazard category one or benchmark one. Green would be a benchmark four or hazard category four. So we can quickly get a, a snapshot 
of the things we're concerned about for um, a particular formulation. And then we also have a score that rolls up, and I mentioned that um, it goes from negative 50 to positive 50. Anything above zero is acceptable, below zero, not acceptable, and we have conversations with our suppliers on how to fix that. Um, so that's just an example of that. This is just a screenshot again of um, the legislative review we do. So you can see some of these are marked as um, we, we can screen against hundreds and hundreds of, of lists. Um, you can see some of these are marked as EPA safer chemical ingredient list, full green circle. Other of these, this red one, it's on um, the European Union um, list. This is their labeling program. And so we can also get a snapshot um, and work with our government affairs team on, are there anything concerning within these regulatory lists? Um, and then this, I just wanna end uh, kind of with this an example of kind of a real life example of how we're using this. So one of the chemistries we've um, committed to phasing out of by 2025 is this chemical called dimethylformamide or DMFA. It's the solvent that is used in production of polyurethane coatings. So, Think synthetic leather and that kind of uh, sheen on top of the leather, that's a polyurethane. And to dissolve the polyurethane, you use a solvent called DMF. And DMF is problematic from a hazard perspective. And so we are working with our material suppliers and chemical suppliers on uh, greener alternatives to DMF as we phase out. Optimally, it would be a drop-in replacement where we don't have to change the process that that these, that these companies could just use a different solvent that doesn't have the same concerns as DMFA. And this is what we're looking at there is, is there a drop-in replacement solvent that, these, that, that, that could be used? And so just quickly looking at the top line is DMFA, which is what we're trying to phase out. And we had several suppliers come to us with different options. And if you look at option number one, well, it's not looking much better than DMFA. It's got a lot of reds, um, gray on this is actually data gaps, which is something, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about the problems with data gaps and lack of information. But for us, if there's not data, that's essentially a red because we don't know what that impact could be. So we treat grays or unknown data as, as a red because we're going to assume worst case scenario. Anyway, quickly, if you look at the bottom option, option number two, it's mostly green, right? So it's, it's a lot better. It's not perfect, it's not all green, but um, going in, we know what those um, impacts can be. And so we can control for those potential small impacts there. And so we would recommend that they would take option two. So this would be a good drop-in replacement for, for dimethylformamide. And so that's one way that we're using it to make decisions in our process. We don't wanna phase out of something and make a regrettable substitution, right? We don't wanna get rid of DMF and replace it with something that's just as bad or worse, but not regulated yet. Um, so we're trying to avoid regrettable substitutions when we're doing that. And this is just a summary of the information that we give to our internal teams and our suppliers when we do these assessments. So we do the regulatory review, the chemical report, did they provide us full disclosure? Sometimes our suppliers don't wanna tell us their, their secret ingredients, and so they'll provide us redacted reports where we can still get the the information, but not the, uh, the, we can get the information on the um, impacts, but not the specific ingredients, um, what our results was and what the next steps are. So um, we found this process to be very helpful and it helped the communication with both our innovation teams and our suppliers. Um, and we're always working to improve it, but, but it's been a really good process over the last four years. Um, yeah, so. That's it. I'll, I'm happy to take any questions now or later. And um, thank you. Thanks so much, Renee. That's really fantastic. Yeah, so we'd love for you to sort of mill over. If you've got some questions now and they're bubbling up, you can go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'd love for Sri to be able to share her screen now as I introduce um, Sri Nararan Sarathi. And I know. She um, so she's going to tell us a little bit about herself too, but um, before she does, Sri received her um, master's in science from chemistry and oh boy, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to 
jump a little further down and I'll let Sri explain a little bit about her work, but Sri's research areas um, of interest are in material science and chemistry. And at PepsiCo, she's leveraging her extensive experience with different polymer chemistries to identify and develop bio-based materials for sustainable, flexible packaging with a good end of life. She has several patents and publications to her credit and is also adjunct faculty for the Department of Green Sciences at Kansas State University. So I'm going to pass it over and let Sri take it away. Thank you very much, Kate, for this invitation to present to this really important group of people for promoting our sustainability journey. So thank you. Uh, just a little brief bio. I think Kate touched on most of the things. I just wanted to let you know I was in school for a very long time. So I did, I have a couple of masters in chemistry and polymer science and a PhD in polymer science and engineering from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Before joining PepsiCo, I was with a specialty chemical company called Ashland, based in Columbus, Ohio, where I was working on very different chemistries and different applications. I joined PepsiCo about 11 years, and since then I've been working on sustainability and sustainable packaging related projects. So I just something on PepsiCo itself. You know, everybody is familiar with PepsiCo. Uh, you know, it has, a, you know, with more than $67 billion in revenue and more than 265,000 employees around the globe. It is one of the biggest food and beverage companies in the world. And it is said that, uh, that our practical brands are enjoyed a billion times per day. So we have about 23 brands that generate more than a uh, uh, billion dollar every year. And most of these products are packaged in plastic. So uh, plastic is a very versatile material and it makes it uh, very uh, useful for critical food and beverage applications. It protects the safety, quality and freshness, extends the shelf life, so it limits food waste and provides consumers with very uh, you know, light and very convenient solutions. I know plastic is getting a bad rap today, but I wanted to emphasize that it is really the single use plastic it should not have a good end of life. That is the problem. So uh, PepsiCo has an agenda, a winning with purpose agenda. So as a part of uh, it, as a publicly committed sustainable packaging goals, which were updated in 2019. And just as I speak, they are updating it to make it even more aggressive. So we want to design 100% of our packaging to be recyclable, compostable, or biodegradable by 2025. We want to increase the recycle content, reduce the virgin plastic. And from a climate point of view, we want to reduce the packaging value chain to contribute to PepsiCo's goal of 40% reduction by 2030. So how are we doing this, especially with relation to plastic packaging? So the three R's come into play here, where we want to reduce the amount of packaging that we put in the market today, or try to recycle them as much as possible to circular economy. And then that becomes the challenge, reinventing our packaging to uh, achieve some of our goals. So on the reinvent side, that could be new packaging materials, but also transforming business models, right? like Soda Stream is one example, which PepsiCo acquired uh, last year. This reduces the amount of packaging quite a bit on our beverage side. But on the food side, the, the project that I have been leading and which I will talk a little bit more about is to develop alternatives for our current flexible packages uh, based on polyolefins by using bio-based materials but also are compostable or biodegradable under composting conditions. So flexible packaging is deceptively simple, but it is way more complex than it appears. As you can see, it's really thin, but it has so many layers within that. So the three main layers is the print film, which is typically a clear film, which where you can print the graphics and it has the sealing property so that you can make it into a bag that you can sell products and sell it. Then you need the barrier film, which is really, really important. Uh, you know, it needs it to keep oxygen away, water vapor away, 
protected from visible light, have the correct stiffness, it has to seal into our bag. And these layers, these films are brought together with the lamination layer. Uh, but there are challenges to recycling these multi-layered flexible packages. One of the reasons is it's made up of different uh, materials. And even if you make it mono material, the current recycling infrastructure, it is the, they, these are two dimensional and then they tend to move in along with the paper contaminating the paper. That is why it is not welcome in the recycling stream today. So an alternate end of life of flexible package would be composting. So there are two kinds of composting. We have the industrial composting that is composted on a large scale. So in these piles, a lot of energy is, uh, heat is uh, generated. So it helps the biodegrade or degrade both the food waste as well as some of the packages that go in. Uh, home composting is the same biodegradation under composting conditions, but under ambient temperatures in, in our backyards, probably, or in small community compost. So our journey with compostable packaging started in 2009, even before my time, then uh, PepsiCo Frito-Lay actually came up with the first uh, polylactic acid-based uh, packaging. Uh, this is this is a material that is available in commodity scale and in large volumes, but the problem is it's expensive processing it and it's only compostable in under like large scale conditions. So then I started leading this work on the development of the next generation of these compostable materials. A lot more biopolymers came into the horizon. For example, polybutyl and succinates, which is partially bio-based and is great to process and has excellent performance, but it's expensive. But the material that we're most interested in is the PHA or the polyhydroxy alkanoids. This is a very cool polymer. It is actually uh, found in nature or it is made by microbes inside them uh, in a bioreactor and from which the PHA is extracted out. And the great part about this material is it's compostable and they're you know, biodegradable under home composting conditions, but also biodegradable in soil and marine, if at all, it is litter, which we don't want. So our strategy to develop these materials is taking a mixture of the different biopolymers, then adding some fillers like minerals or biofillers to it to help with the cost and come up with blends with improved biodegradability in many environments. But uh, the but doesn't stop here. So the final package actually requires more materials and engineering solutions. So, you know, the compound that we had optimized that I talked about in my earlier slide has to be extruded into thin films. Then they have to be coated and metallized to get that barrier that I was talking about. And then Clear folds are taken and you have to print it and then you have to bring them both together by an adhesive lamination. So a lot of work, we've worked on this for a few years now and uh, we finally we come up with a commercially feasible solution which has the right balance of compostability with performance and cost. I am very uh, glad to let you know that, uh, you know, in 2018, we actually had did some successful pilots of the industrial composting packaging around the globe. Uh, then Chile and Wal Walmart in Chile, where this was piloted, as well as uh, at the airport in India on their vending machines, and where there was uh, infrastructure to collect food waste so we could instruct the people to just uh, like uh, dispose off the package along with the food waste. So um, those were very successful pilots and COVID delayed things a little bit, but, uh, but we are going to be launching these industrial compostable packages uh, this year in some niche applications. And in parallel, we're also working on developing home compostable package, which should be hopefully piloted next year. Thank you so much for your time. I'd be happy to take your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. 
Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sri. Um, that was really terrific. Um, and yeah, I'd love for us to just, you know, put some big thank yous in, in the chat um, for both Sri and Renee. And, we, and it'll be my pleasure to now introduce our third panelist, Laura. Um, and yes, if you've got questions, you know, you can go ahead and put them in the chat now, or you can hold on to them and, you know, you can point them to the panelists after Laura's presentation. So, um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Hawk. Dr. Laura Hawk is currently a materials innovation engineer at Patagonia. I will say Laura is someone who I've known around green chemistry education for quite some time. I met her at a green chemistry and engineering conference gosh, it has to be like eight years ago, maybe even more. Um, so it's really exciting to have her um, where she's, so she's responsible at Patagonia for research, identification, and development of novel and sustainable chemistry and textile technologies for use in Patagonia's product lines. Prior to Patagonia, Laura worked as a technical fellow for the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council, GC3, focusing on establishing and growing the GC3 green and bio-based chemistry startup network, providing technical expertise and supporting GC3 project groups. She holds a PhD from in, in inorganic materials chemistry from the University of Toronto and has over 10 years of experience in applied materials chemistry research and design. So Laura, go ahead, take it away. Oh, you're still muted, Laura. swear I clicked on mute. Uh, sorry. <laughs> All right, second time around. I just wanted to say that the feeling is very mutual. Um, I've been a huge fan of Beyond Benign for many years. Um, so it's a big honor to be able to speak here today um, and share a bit of our work. Um, so for those of you that um, don't know us, Patagonia is a uh, outdoor apparel company. So we make outdoor gear uh, for sports such as skiing, rock climbing, surfing. Uh, we also make a bunch of cozy fleeces. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about um, kind of the more innovation sides. I think Renee did a really awesome job of talking about the um, kind of like how we think about the, the compliance and sort of the um, ingredient innovation. Um, and I'm gonna talk uh, and, you know, I think we, we do that as well. Um, maybe not quite to the amazing degree that Nike does. Uh, I've, I think you guys do a really great job and we're a bit smaller of a company than you, but um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about um, material innovation um, and focus a little bit on a couple green chemistry innovations that we have released um, recently. And, um, but before I jump into that, um, I wanted to start off with our mission statement because I think that it really does get to the core of what motivates um, us as a company. Shoot, oh, there we go. Um, what motivates us as a company and um, sets the stage for um, how we think about approaching innovation and exploring new technologies. Um, so Patagonia has always been an environmental company. Um, but two years ago, we updated our mission statement to be even more deliberate than it was uh, and saying that we are in business to save our home planet, uh, which is a bit of a lofty goal. <laughs> um, but you know, our leadership in particular just really wants us, um, the entire company, to think about how we can push boundaries um, and help lead our industry in um, being a positive influence on our planets. Um, so I wanted to share, uh, you know, and obviously that has um, many forms, but I wanted to start off by sharing um, our uh, carbon goal. So we have a goal of being uh, carbon neutral across our entire business by 2025. Um, and, you know, an analysis that we did um, a couple of years ago now, I think, um, Patagonia supply chain accounts for seven or 97 percent of our carbon emissions and 86 percent of that comes from the creation of the materials that we use in our products. And so, you know, of course, uh, we can work with our we can and will work with our supply chain um, to convert to using renewable energy. But because materials accounts for such a large portion of our footprint, um, material innovation and particularly chemistry innovation have a big role to play in achieving this goal. Um, so, um, yeah, and so I wanted to um, just kind of before jumping into some specifics, I wanted to zoom out a bit and um, just talk about the process um, that goes into actually making um, a textile article. Uh, I feel like there's a lot more 
going on in making a, a t-shirt or a jacket than most people realize. Um, certainly more than I realized before I started working here at Patagonia. Um, you know, and so you have um, these raw material processes. So whether it's a, a natural fiber like cotton or hemp or wool, um, you'll have these impacts. Um, and, and chemistry can be used at each one of these processes. You know, so the the impacts of, you know, think about fertilizers or pesticides that could potentially be used in um, the growing of natural fibers, or if it's a synthetic fiber such as cotton or nylon, um, obviously there's there can be quite a bit of um, chemical inputs. Um, you know, and then once you have these raw materials, then you need to um, form them into yarn. So um, through spinning or um, extrusion, uh, then you can produce these, the yarns that ultimately will get knitted or woven into um, forming a textile. And then, um, then those textiles are uh, dyed and finished. So, um, and by finishing, I mean um, adding functionality such as um, durable water repellents, um, softeners, um, wicking agents help something with quick drying, um, anti-odor treatments, etc. And then, you know, once you have the textile, then um, you cut and sew it into produce the garment um, or bag. Um, and, you know, it may not seem like there's a lot of chemistry used here, but um, at this stage in the process, you still do have um, printing, there could be um, spot removal, uh, there are some garment dyeing and garment washing processes. And so each part of this process, um, which all of our products go through, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities where we can think about how, um, you know, not only the, the chemical impacts that we have and sort of like the, the bad chemicals that we would want to try to avoid, um, but also, you know, how can we potentially think about using chemistry and chemistry innovation to have a positive impact? You know, our supply chain is where we have, um, that's our physical footprint in the world. and um, you know, we really do care about the workers and the communities um, where our products are made. And so we want to be using the best chemistry possible, um, not only steering away from the bad stuff, but also steering towards the good stuff. Um, so I wanted to start out with uh, something we just released in 2020, which is an update to um, one of our most iconic styles, which is the Nano Puff. So the Nano Puff jacket is a really lightweight uh, synthetic um, insulation piece. So um, it's a polyester um, face and backer fabric with a polyester non-woven insulation inside. And I really love what our marketing team did here uh, with this, uh, this ad campaign that they had around it where they said innovation isn't always visible. And um, particularly in this product, I think that's quite true. Um, this is something that the customer wouldn't notice a difference. The performance is the same. Um, but, uh, you know, we worked really closely with our partners, Primaloft, um, who's the manufacturer of the insulation that goes in the middle of this piece. And so this is, um, this type of insulation is, uh, it's a polyester non-woven. So, um, it's, uh, if you've ever seen like batting that goes into, um, a comforter, it's kind of similar to that, but because in this application, um, it's a jacket, it's going to go through like a lot of mechanical stress and strain. Um, this is actually designed to be packed down tightly into its own pocket so that it's easy to take on, you know, on a climbing trip or, you know, some sort of expedition. Um, you can, uh, so it, it has, um, it's designed to go through this, um, these mechanical strains. And so it requires a binder to keep the robustness in the fiber and ensure that the product can last as long as um, we want it to, uh, we, we have a lifetime guarantee of Patagonia. So, um, you know, we want our things to be lasting, you know, 10, 15 years longer if we can. Um, anyway, so we worked really closely with our partner Primaloft to, um, come up with a better way to, um, to bind the fibers together. And we actually, uh, were able to develop a new type of binder that, um, can self cure through exposure to air instead of being baked in the ovens which reduced the carbon emissions by 52% compared to the conventional production methods that we have uh, that we used to use. And because this is one of our top 10 styles um, with this change alone, uh, and we only did this as of last year, but um, with this change alone, we've been able to reduce our carbon emissions by over 5,000 or 500,000 um, pounds of CO2 um, just in the last year. So um, I think this is a, a cool example of a way that uh, a chemistry change 
um, can have a pretty strong positive impact. And it's not necessarily just moving away from something bad that we don't like, but it's actually a chemical change that, um, you know, has a strong positive impact. And then the second example that I wanted to share um, is another th another um, product that we released uh, recently. So this is a collaboration with our partners at Braille. So Braille is a company that um, actually is also based here uh, in Ventura, California, um, which is also Chumash land. I loved the land acknowledgement starting at the beginning. So Ventura is unceded Chumash land uh, and Braille. So that's where Patagonia's headquarters is. And Braille is also a headquartered here. Um, and uh, they started, um, actually, they're founded by a couple of surfers, so very similar to Patagonia and our uh, origin story. But they saw um, a large, you know, I mean, at being surfers and being really connected with the ocean, um, you know, they started, you know, becoming more and more aware of the, the issues around plastic waste in the ocean. And um, in particular, in the communities that they were in, um, they were down in Chile surfing and saw um, a large quantity of fishing nets um, and, you know, started doing some research and found that discarded fishing nets actually make up 10% of the uh, global marine plastics by volume, um, which is something that I, I didn't know. And they're particularly harmful because, um, you know, if they're released into the water, they can ensnare wildlife. Um, so getting rid of... Um, these fishing nets is, is very important, but they didn't really have a good end of life scenario. And so um, Braille started a company to partner with fishing communities in South America, um, starting in Chile, and uh, they've expanded to Argentina. And I think they're now expanding into Peru to collect and recycle these fishing nets at the end of their life. And they have um, set up a business model where they're able to pay the fishermen to return their nets. So that also is additional income for the, the fishermen um, and it ensures a, a high rate of return of these nets um, at the end of their life, making it easier to collect. Um, and this may not necessarily on face value seem like a chemistry innovation, um, but as uh, my colleagues and I often joke, making stuff from trash, quote unquote, isn't that easy. <laughs> um, and this project actually took uh, more than three years of work between Patagonia and Boreo to um, get the material to hit our performance specs, um, and actually be able to make um, something out of it. And so the first product, uh, the first product that we launched with Braille um, is uh, this hat brim. So it's made from HTPE, which has been recycled from 100% uh, fishing nets uh, collected in Chile. And um, this is something that we also just launched about a year ago. And um, in that time, we've been able to keep over 35 tons of plastic waste out of the oceans um, just from these hat brims alone. Uh, and this isn't the, the only project we're doing them. There's a lot of other uh, exciting stuff coming. So um, with that, I will um, stop here and happy to take any questions. Thank you.